This episode of Fresh and Buds is brought to you by Snack to Reality, folks. Do you love snacks? I do. I know I do. Tommy Fresh loves snacks. Don't really love illusionists, though, and auras. So I like to grab a snack to reality sometimes to really show those illusionists what's up. Get those auras out of there, folks. Thank you for the sponsorship, Snack to Reality. We really appreciate it. Available in nacho cheddar cheese and cool blue cheese uh, varieties. Very, very good. Snack to Reality. Fresh and Buds right now. Fresh and Buds. Folks, welcome back to yet another episode of Fresh and Buds. I am your host, Tommy Fresh, and you are all of my buds. And today, we're joined once again, basically an honorary co-host at this point. My pinch hitter, you know, whenever whenever we run into some technical difficulties or some uh, scheduling conflicts, Pat Shaw from Off the Rails TCG hops on the show. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing fantastic. Look, I got a lot of ideas uh, for the new the new show with the two of us. Uh, some name changes. I think we could change some of the curtains and the layout of the place. I got some really big ideas. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm getting comfortable in the seat. You know? <laughs> well, you know, hey, listen, we, we have a budget, Pat, so we're going to stick to it, folks. <laughs> uh, but we do have a great show for you today. Uh, we're going to, well, we're going to talk about the teams. We're all about teams today because we are on the eve of Pro Tour Los Angeles and Mm -hmm. teams have been the talk of the town, right? We have Mm -hmm. had a whole like round table from LSS, Brian Gottlieb, a bunch of other devs talking about what they expect from the meta at LA and what happened in the road to Nats season. And they started talking about teams. So we're going to talk about teams and guess what? I'm going to say teams a million more times in this podcast. And I love it. We're going to get a Microsoft sponsorship in no time. Get those teams counters up right now, folks. Uh, What do you think about teams in in general, Pat, before we even get into what we're going to talk about? The concept of groups coming together for, (laughs) for competitive edge. It's like, I, I, uh, you know, the big thing is what is flesh is flesh and blood, a team sport at this point. And you can't deny the competitive edge you get from a group of like-minded individuals focuses, fo- focusing in and practicing with intent towards right the towards a goal. There is a world of a difference between the person who you know qualified uh, for PTLA, uh, you know, in some way got a PTI or something like that, but is sitting at home jamming teleshower games, you know, even, you know, even if it's a thousand teleshower games by themselves, they're still only playing the way that they know how to play, right? They're only learning at, at their own pace and they have no one else for the, to give feedback to. Uh, and, you know, that can really slow progression. But if you have, right, the hive mind working and building towards, towards a goal here, you might have, you know, a few Kasai players, a few KO players, a few Kano players, everyone's doing something a little different, taking data, putting it together, and actually quantifying what good results are against quality opponents if you trust everybody in your team to you know be that there. Um, but when you pull that all together, you have, you know, you have a pretty strong uh, foundation to get into a, a competition like Pro Tour LA that's coming up. And I think we're seeing, I know this might be like the golden age of, of uh, <laughs> you know, of Team Fab right now. This is, you know, this is like early 2000s WWE. We got the Dudley Boys, the Hardys, <laughs> Edge and Christian. Everyone's coming in for the Tables, Ladders, Chair match. Minmax Games had the, the has the Team Battle Royal happening, I think, as we record this. Uh, it is it is in progress, um, and so. uh, you know, and that there's you know we there's teams from the Philippines, uh, you know, making a a, a, a stink in scenes. We have we have a lot of the APAC uh, you know region coming in and finally getting their you know getting their dues here, and you know, well established U.S. teams are growing and you know exponential numbers it seems like sometimes but everyone's converging in la 
it's I feel like everything's happening, you know, at, at just the right time, right? The the product is is at a high point with heavy hitters, right? The the meta is at a high point to some people. If you like a nice a wide open meta, uh, that's happening. And like I said there's there's a whole whole slew of uh, high quality teams uh, out there, and they're gonna you know they're vying to see who's who's the best. And this is this is a great time, great weekend. This is gonna be a great weekend. Oh, it's gonna be a blast to watch, and I'm super excited for it. And we're gonna really talk about each team. Uh, not each team. There's there's actually probably too t- too many teams to to kind of really cover. But we 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 we're we're covering a lot of the U S based ones as well as some ones from Europe, and uh, you know the. Southern Hemisphere of, of all different sides of it, and there's and, a whole globe, and there's a team for every part of it. Yeah, yeah. So, and and then there's teams that are arguably just international in themselves, based on on uh, their mm-hmm. their player base. So it's going to be pretty interesting. But before we get to that, I did want to talk about. So this is kind of interesting. Pat was on not too long ago, right? You were on maybe five or six episode, episodes ago, and what we were doing then was like talking. It feels like it. It feels like it. I, you know, it feels like I can't escape you, Pat. Let's be no. honest. No. <laughs> um, we we were discussing what we were going to bring to RTNs and our thoughts mm-hmm. on on what that RTN meta was going to look like and how how we felt about it. And it was also interesting because it was the first meta I was really like for like an actual season, like on a team. Right, myself was mm-hmm. on a team. The mm-hmm. conspiracy. We'll talk about them in a bit. And, you know, I came in late, so I, I didn't really test anything going into the season with them, but I did get to participate as a team member and it was a lot of fun. But how did your RTNs go? Terribly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was going to go to two. I ended up having to back out of the second one. So I did go to the first one that I, I had meant to go. I felt, I honestly felt really, really good going into it. I had tested into I, I it was like over 200 games between variant uh, deck variants of kasai um and i felt like i had you know reached reached a point where i could uh you know i could compete and um i went uh i, I went oh two and i dropped out of frustration okay. um i faced i faced a dash and dash is like a kind of a bad matchup for for kasai um and uh they just can out efficient you like they can just do things more efficiently when they have like the pistol out and um and they got uh it was like i think they got off three max v's that that game and then two high octanes like they just hit everything right like some of these decks when they high roll they just get you Mm. and um uh so uh and and they're local to my lgs so uh like drove you know drove an hour out of the way ran into my buddies anyways so lost to one in the first round uh lost to a ko in the second round that uh you know they cast bones and they did the thing where they just come back at you know a big 13 go again command and conquer when you at least when you don't want it you know so it just happens that way um i think i think part of you know we're talking about that the team dynamic here um getting in these paper reps is so important because like that type of variance that I experienced in those games could have happened right in any game in paper. Right. And I just wasn't, I wasn't prepared for that. Right. So I did a lot of Talishar games and a lot of like webcam games, but actually sitting down against a live opponent, you know, I put all a lot of stock into uh, getting ready for that moment. And then you sit down and you realize that's the first time you've, maybe sat across from somebody in a, in a while and it just, you know, it hits different than it does digitally. Right. So, you know, getting the cards out and, and like experiencing real variants happening uh, and trying to navigate those uh, you know, some of those bad moments. Um, if you, if, if that's the first time you're doing that because you've been training by yourself, like that's, that's a moment you might not be prepared for. And I wasn't. Right. Yeah. So, um, so I did put I put all my uh, I invested all my my energy into getting there for that RTN. I went 0 and 2. I was salty as fuck and <laughs> I I bailed bailed after that. Um so that's how my RTN season went. Uh it, you know it is what it is. It is exactly. That's what I always <laughs> yeah. say and 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 guess what the buds certainly let me know that I do say that all the time because it is what it is and that mm-hmm. is 
exactly what it is. Uh, I had I a little said it better myself. <laughs> I had a little bit better of a a experience in my RTNs, but I was playing a deck that I actually do have a ton of paper reps with mm-hmm. in, in Riptide. Obviously, played a lot of Riptide. Uh, ended up getting my qualification. Uh, very luckily, snuck into top eight at the the CC RTN that I did. Uh, unfortunately, it, it it meant that I, you know, a, a, a bud uh, Dana, who's been on the show, had to uh, draw or lose uh, the last round, and and then I was in, and I managed to sneak in, and then ran into a a leading a leading member of the fabled Runaways, Daniel Rakowski, in the top eight, who was on Kasai. It's not a great matchup for Kasai. Kasai and Riptide. Not, it's a terrible, terrible matchup. And yep. and Daniel was yeah, he said right away he's like oh no and he and mm-hmm. and you know Dan's the best we 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 play all the time Jersey locals such a sweet guy he's been on the show and uh he he decided to say I'm not gonna play a normal Kasai game I'm gonna just try to <laughs> fatigue yep. uh this yep. this uh, Riptide which you know we're starting to learn more and more. Riptide is pretty efficient at not getting fatigued sometimes. So, you know, and I, I was able to pull it off and then ran into Michael Fang in the top four and Fang uh, uh, got me, got me good, but I already qualified. So I was pretty happy. And then I did a draft RTN <laughs> that went horribly. That was just like, mm-hmm. God, like this, this format is so much fun. I really enjoy it, yep. but I got to say there sometimes it just feels like, wow, your, your opponent really got the way better deck and like even though i was like maybe only two or one of two brutes my opponent was the only betsy you know <laughs> like yeah, and you're just yeah. Like, oh my yeah. god so there's a lot of stories like that coming out i i, I do feel like right everyone's super happy about heavy hitters as a, like a set and as like a limited format but um the amount of stories i hear of like you know five ko's right and then maybe like one Olympia and like a Betsy. Right. And it always ends up being like the Betsy or the Victor that it like pulls it out. It seems like in a draft pod like that, that just gets all the gas. It's, it, you know, and that's the thing, you know, when we had Nathan on a couple of weeks ago, he said like, if there's more than two guardians, guardians totally screwed, but mm-hmm. guardian is something to be feared uh, in that one to two range. But I guess that's probably true of any kind of, hero in in a, mm-hmm. in a draft set but um so what would you say you know you talk about the the difference between playing in paper and, and, and practicing like mm-hmm. on talishar is that your main takeaway here you know as to what you felt didn't work like you, you just perhaps didn't feel like you were in the zone with with uh the deck as as much as you should have been well i think so you know, we, we talk about how wide open the meta is, and um, there's something to be said about, uh, like, the spread of matchups. And I definitely wasn't, like, prepared for a lot of dash. Like, I was prepared for a lot of new heroes. So, um, like, when you're when, when you're playing on... So when you're playing on Talishar, right, uh, one of the things... Uh, one of the things I try to do is never join a game uh, so that my, uh, like, my biases aren't influencing like my results so like i won't i won't join like, you know if kano's floating there who's going to join the kano game right like so you if you only join the katsu games you know showing up and you you, you know in your results on talishar are are very positive you know is that you know is that because you just faced you you have a you know a handle on one particular matchup and you keep joining that matchup and and you know kind of doing that or is there something you know, can you do something better about that? So creating my own matchup and it letting people come in uh, allows that kind of, uh, allows me to free myself of that kind of influence. Um, on the, on the downside, I guess, is that like, uh, it turns out there's a lot of like Kano's and Azalea's just lurking out there because no one will join their games. Right. So they, they come in all the time. Um, and, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of like the solo play and training is just learning like learning your lines and your matchups but at a much slower pace right because mm-hmm. you're teaching yourself and like i'm i'm an okay pilot uh like i'm a good pilot with uh like a sideboard guy right like if you tell me what exactly i'm supposed to do 
I can go do that, right? Execute the plan. If I have to find out what the plan is and like I have to build it myself and figure that out, I, I'm going to take time to do that. And, you know, by the time I'm ready to execute that plan, it's probably taken me much, much more reps than it would have taken, right? A group a concentrated on the same goal goal there, right? So um, like post RTN, I actually feel like I'm in a very good place. Um it, with Kasai because I did kind of learn um, some of the main heuristics for myself in terms of when I sh- when I should go big and when I shouldn't when I should be okay with you know just swinging twice and calling it a day when I'm okay with going tall and not having go again when to you know when to use the boots and when to save the boots that kind of thing and over time. Um, refining my card selection process so that I'm not um, kind of flip-flopping between something like, you know, I'm really deciding between an over or like a, an aggressive deck versus like a heavily defensive deck. Uh, you know, neither one seemed to really fit, but when I put the cards that I like to play out of both of those kind of molds and put them together, I've found myself in a, you know, a package that I feel comfortable playing with that allows me to play that kind of mid rangey game that I like, but allows me to set up these tall turns where I can, um, you know, I, like a big example is Spoils of War. Like, how do you use Spoils of War effectively? Mm-hmm. Is it is it a two card hand where you have Spoils in a blue and you're just swinging twice for six, or is it better off to kind of maybe Arsenal that Spoils, be happy with like a bl- a Blade Runner in a blue to swing twice, uh, you know, Arsenal that Spoils, and then wait for your you know Blade Flurry, uh, uh, slice and dice. Uh, you know, your big five card ish hand where uh, you might be able to attack for like seven and eight, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, between uh, two hands to really ensure you'll get, um, you know, at least two copper is usually if you you really want to get like two copper out of the spoils um, per turn. But if they just block out cleanly and efficiently, uh, right, with your just two card hand, you didn't really do anything there. Um, But kind of so like learning those things and understanding that uh, like some of the cards are just like it's okay to play like good cards even if they don't necessarily mm-hmm. do you know, do a lot of this. So like that all you got for Kasai is like a really it's a really good card. Uh, it's for me it's a main board card. It's not a sideboard card, and that's one of the decisions that I had to kind of like decide against. And I think that one in particular is replacing like a yellow uh, Outland skirmish, um, and it's just like you know blocking for three and getting a card is better than buffing for two and potentially getting a copper but telegraphing a super blockable play right so like those kind of decisions are are what i kind of had to to mess with um i will say that the uh the influx of kano matchups allowed me to really kind of understand that matchup a little better and it still kind of sucks but Mm -hmm. (laughs) like i feel much better into it um it did force me to like i'm running ab2 now and uh and i am running three oasis in my sideboard uh because the biggest oasis the biggest wildfire can get is six right so mm-hmm. if you pitch a if you pitch a blue for oasis you still have two floating you can prevent four and still still take the two off of the wildfire after it's been max buffed with crucible and uh and notes on top of that so like it still works within like your own you know your play style there yeah. Um, now I'm working on like the Prism Awakener matchup and trying to get that one uh, solved. So heavy, uh, uh, not heavy. Uh, down in down in dirties have made it into the sideboard for that one. Um, I I did see I saw Florin Christian Login uh, play Kasai into Will Bradshaw's Prism in the league that means nothing for As. Mm-hmm. So we we called that game together and Florin did like a masterful job of just handling Prism, but I saw down in dirty, so I put him in. Uh <laughs> you know, it's like hey, look, he did the thing. Um and, you know, and they work they work really well. And I've stolen a few things from uh from uh Hake, I forget his last name, but on the from the Battle Harden, uh he made top four, I believe, with a Kasai. Uh, he was playing with some hold the lines, uh, which is, uh, yeah, right. And, and especially in Kasai where you're generally blocking four with right dynamos plus three. Uh, and now you have your, your two 
two reaction um, to make it a six block. Like it just just flows, right? So it just goes. And if you faced a Blood Rush Battle or something like that, it's even better. Yep. And so it's got a huge upside. So uh, like things like that. So I, I I feel like I'm I'm now pretty comfortable with her. You know, uh, like in in most matchups, I feel pretty good um, going on. I am. I named my like versions of the decks. So I'm on Mark thirty three. So I have 33 okay. different versions oh of Kasai uh, that I've run. They're not all like, yeah. you know, there, there's not there's not a whole lot of difference between any of them. But like right now, I have like a 70 percent win rate with my with my latest iteration. I'll take that. That's right? I mean, like I think that's know? the baseline for you to really consider. I mean, I think you you gotta look at like I the never, high high 60s. I don't I don't hit 70. percent I don't. Hit, <laughs> <laughs> it just is what it is. Uh, yeah, but I think like high 60s, 70s is like, you know, probably normal, right? You know, yeah. I mean, I, gosh, I mean, I remember like, you know, back in the when I would listen to magic content, you know, pros would be like, yeah, my win rate overall is 66%. And that's yeah, probably right? the best mm-hmm. in, 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 in that game. Obviously, Flesh and Blood is a little mm-hmm. bit different. But um, now, you know, I'm, I'm glad to, to see that you're still working on that deck. And just to say, you know, the blue and spoils has better math on the hatchets. Uh, but you know, <laughs> hey, hey, it's true. It's very true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> coming in for four and three is 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 a little bit better. But I understand. Uh, you know, maybe you just want to play the savers. I get it. But you know, uh, in terms of me for what worked and what didn't, you know, uh, there's a lot of still questions with the Riptide deck. You know, I got my my you know my ass kicked at Battle Hardened Philadelphia. With Riptide, and I learned a lot. You, I took you a made lot. the stream, though. You I got, did make you got the stream. Match. God, that was a close. It was one a good. Too. It was a good game. It was a good that game. Was a good game. That's like you had. I, you had him on the back foot almost the whole I time. I did, and and he forgot about the <laughs> the how Dreadboard worked, and he had the yep. the reckless yep. swing. But you know, and I was really confused. It's like, does, did he not arsenal yeah. the reckless swing? And but anyway, mm. it doesn't matter. I ended up getting a little bit of a low variance hand. You know, when, when he attacked, I mean, he, he was counting my deck, so or my graveyard, so I knew that he knew that I had a lot of two blocks coming. Um, and it's just unfortunate they did come when they came, but that is the game, and is a TCG, and that's variance. But, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I took a lot of notes, and that was, like, the first time I really, really took a lot of notes, um, like, in the game. Like, sometimes I'll take notes after, but, like, this is every, – every game I took notes, like – not during the game. That's illegal. Uh, after the game, I'm like, okay, it this is, is what unique. happened. Here's my takeaway. And actually, it's really helped my deck building. I'm, I'm, I'm on a really cool list that, you know, it's kind of evolved out of the previous Riptide list. It's still a tough meta for Riptide because, because there's so much going on. It's hard to, like, target specific things. Like, you know, Droma, you can win, right? Like, if you race and, and whatever, you just got to ignore the fact that that exists and just say, I, I got to race them. I can win it. It's not a great win rate, whatever. And we talked about this with Dagan last week. You know, you, you mentioned two decks back to back, Kano and Prism. Sometimes you just got to say, I want to prepare for it or I don't and just hope not to do it and maybe try to eke out a win some other way. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, you, you still need the Oasis when they play the wildfire, right? You know, you need it yeah. to line up. Exactly. So like, and look, people, it's the only two cards that matter, right? That's the dirty little secret. Yeah. Oasis, wildfire. Yeah. If they win another way, they've earned it. Yeah. But you only Oasis the wildfire, you only care about it. You just, you, everything else, you just kind of take in stride and do do what you got to do. But exactly. don't, don't waste it on anything else, folks. Yeah, but I mean, and it's funny, like even I, I, got, I got totally destroyed by a prism that weekend. And even when I played my poppers, they celestial whatever it, right? You know, you just like Arrow, right celestial reprimand is a stupid, stupid card. It's stupid because oh, like I mean, like brutal. obviously it's, a, it's that a, and angelic wrath. Those two cards oh, yeah. have made the prism so annoying. It's it's so good, but like you know what they they have to give up the slots to do it. So you know there it is balanced in that way, and and obviously mm-hmm. prism's not running away with the meta, but it is uh, interesting, you know. To kind of take away from that, RTN season, you know, would have liked to, for you to have qualified. I'm glad I did, but, you know, there's always next year. And ProQuest season's coming up in a couple of weeks. It's very exciting. Uh, not sure yes, if you're playing yep. any of those. But, 
Um, we only have there's uh, last time I checked, I only had two in the region, like, and they weren't oh, wow. good times. So I have to, I do have to check again. But um, for some reason, they weren't. Uh, there wasn't a lot happening in terms of ProQuest. I would double uh, check yeah. now because I, when I initially checked, there was not that. I only saw two as well, and now mm-hmm. there's like six, seven, or eight in New Jersey or in the New Jersey area. Um, but uh, let's talk about LA. Right, we're on the the eve of LA. Mm-hmm. We mentioned teams. We're going to talk about teams. Before we do that, we have a special edition of the fresh faves. Right, normally we would do the fresh faves, whatever the most recent set is. We did that last time you're on, so we're going to do. Dude, I, I do this so often, and we're going to run out of cards. <laughs> yeah. Well, we got a special one, folks. Buckle your seatbelts. We have Pro Tour Los Angeles breakouts fresh faves. Ooh. Our picks for what's going to break out uh, at this um, wonderful Pro Tour this weekend. First, Pat, which hero do you think is going to be the breakout star this weekend? Oh, man. Um, You know, uh, I'll put my money on Azuri. Uh, They showed up and took the battle hardened, and I think that surprised a lot of folks. Um, I'll tell you what, not the assassin folks. (laughs) <laughs> uh, they were they were they came ready, um, but uh, I I follow uh, uh, Collins' work there, Kidder Fox uh, on Assassin made top eight there, um, and uh, the Assassin channel, the Plague Hive just had uh, the winner on to discuss their 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 contract list, and um, the, the con- contract Azuri is like the dream for assassin players. They just <laughs> they want to do the things and play the mask of perdition and, and get stuff done. And, uh, and, and, and he did. Uh, so I, Azuri in assassin in general, I think is like sneakily well positioned. Like it has a lot of good matchups. It still has poor illusionist matchups, but they're learning how to like, navigate those now and it's not just necessarily like are they favorable no but can an elite pilot of an azuri or an arachne take take an illusionist game yeah it, you know they have a puncher's chance uh going in there but um given all this like the you know the the, the state of this kind of value oriented meta that we seem to be in where there's a lot of you know there's there, your kasai's right your warriors are doing things your your brutes are doing things. There's a lot of numbers. It, people care about numbers, not necessarily a ton for on hits. Even like Victor, right? Victor's uh, a lot of dominate and chunk, but not necessarily a lot of like huge disruption uh, stuff. Azuri, right, is 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 almost all disruption, right? It it wants to constantly be putting you in a bad uh, bad situation and either giving you the you know the affliction tokens or taking cards away from either your hand or your arsenal, but uh, doing things that some of the other other heroes aren't at the moment, and I think it has uh, it has potential to uh, you know to eke it out and get get into a pretty high spot here coming into Pro Tour LA. That's a great pick. That's a great pick. I'm gonna go with another one of uh, the heroes that might be close to your heart there, Pat. I'm gonna say Katsu. This is gonna be a big mm-hmm, weekend for mm-hmm, Katsu, mm-hmm. and I believe somebody yep. uh, you know on my team had mentioned. Like that, like dishonor was sold out in in the European market, right? Oh Leading yeah, to LA. oh yeah, yeah. All as, right. as well as some some Azalea stuff, but like, you know, the the we see this all the time. Like when when we have these large international high prestige tournaments, different regions have different ideas, and mm-hmm. you know, I think that Katsu could be. The deck that you know kind of surprises people. There, there is game into a lot of different heroes. Yep. I'm obviously, pretty yep. good into Dromai. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I think great into a lot of the brutes. To be honest, like, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's hard to block. It really is. And and I think their their main concern might be some of the warriors that can maybe outvalue them if they're blocking efficiently. If they're on the more of the the heavy blocking schemes. But mm-hmm. you know, I I think that Katsu could this could be the tournament for Katsu, which is kind of funny, right? You know, it's like all these new toys 
and then right. Katsu. And then o- I mean, got the OG shows. Up. Yeah, that just was- before, just before the breakout, right? Just before <laughs> Parthenus Veil. Vale. Uh, I'm I'm excited for the keynote speech, by the way, for uh for this Pro Tour because there's gonna be it's gonna be something, right? It's gotta something, be something. Something. Weird. Um, but you're right. You know, Katsu. Uh, uh, people have been kind of afraid of coming back to Katsu, um, because of a prevalence of Guardians. But it doesn't seem like there's a Victor. Uh, but not so much Bravo you see lately. And if you can kind of dodge the the Victor matchup a bit, and even if you do, they're figuring it out. Yeah. Um, they, you know, Katsu is in a great place. Uh, if you look at like uh, what Pudding Tam has put out there um, and uh, in the past, and he posted recently about, uh, you know, being, you know, three three bonds of ancestry in a turn is really, really good. You know, if you run your mask of pouncing links and you try to set up that huge turn and, you know, people just can't stop it, right? If you, if you get it, if you can get multiple bonds in a turn, you know, you're just adding card value you know, just in, in the game there, as long as, uh, you know, you have the, the one turn where you can break breeze riders and if you're going to do like a whelming thing, but if you can get your descendant gust waves, uh, like stacked up to have that, you know, to, to be able to combo multiple bonds, like you're in a really good, really good spot and it can overwhelm an opponent very quickly and you don't need an art of war or, you know, mm-hmm. some other, you know, force multiplier to do that though. You know, most of the time, Art of Wars are, you know, currently in, in most Katsu lists as it is. So, like, if you pop off with that, even better. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's still doing really good stuff. It never really stopped and mm-hmm. and has has a lot of pilot kind of focused um, advantages, I would say, uh, that maybe Phi doesn't have. I mean, Phi is certainly, like, you know, you still got to be a great pilot to do well with any of these decks. But I think, like, yes. like Katsu challenges both yourself as a pilot and your opponent as a pilot a lot more than most decks i think and and mm-hmm. if if you if you're a great katsu pilot I, I think you're dangerous this weekend now what about a breakout weapon this weekend a breakout weapon and like i think if reinar has a shot at anything uh it's going to be on the back of the mini meat axe mini meat axe <laughs> Holy yeah, smokes. so you're going to run, if you run Mandible Claws and Mini Meat Axe with all the agility tokens floating around there, like it doesn't, the no go again naturally on, you know, because it does, that's not on the second claw, so, uh, is kind of wiped away there. And the discard, right, it's if, if you've done the thing, you discard and draw, but you trigger Reinar's Intimidate uh, on the Mini Meat Axe. And like it's sneakily disruptive. And if you've done all the rest of the things and you swing with mini mean axe for go again, your opponent loses another card, a card they didn't expect to lose. And so, you know, I, Reinar is one of those heroes that, you know, people might not expect. People have been kind of poo pooing on. And, you know, you might see some action going on there. And if they are, I think it's going to be because the mini mean axe added that little extra intimidation. Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, you know, I, I would say the ball breaker is probably a better pick uh, if if they're if you're going to look at the one hand. But the ravenous meat axe, I still think, is actually a pretty dangerous card. But I'll give you the mini meat axe. I don't think anybody's thinking that one. You might be you might be on the island with the, with the mini meat axe. But like, hey. there's, like, there's a bunch of Ryanair players right now going, damn it. He knows the sauce. He knows the sauce. <laughs> uh, my breakout. <laughs> weapon is uh sledge it's not like a flashy one but i think that the if it, if this weekend is a numbers game sledge is mm-hmm. is the numbers right and just being able to play a tunic every three turns just pitch a card for six damage is going to be uh pretty important i think in the victors and arguably some of the the bravos but i think victor is probably more interested in the sledge mm-hmm. uh I'm, i'd be excited to see some sledge action this weekend and it would make me uh very um i don't know almost like warm and fuzzy inside because it brings me back to that one columbus uh realm brawl where they play flip it or rip it with uh first edition crew and i forget who okay <laughs> i forget who flipped and ripped the cold foil sledge uh but it was uh 
it was so a, it's, it's a painful painful yeah, experience a painful, a painful one I, I want to say it was dagan but I, I could be wrong there um equipment what is there gonna be a, a breakout equipment this is this is one that's like kind of hard to pick like an equipment slot that's gonna be a breakout mm-hmm. but anything you're thinking here um hmm i think yeah so picking let's uh, picking heroes that or, you know, might do something here. Um, Vestige of Soul is, you know, a, a piece of chest equipment from Prism that uh, kind of went away and, you know, for the last little bit with Awakener uh, coming about, they've been using the Robe of Rap, whatever it's called. The, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's, we don't like to remember what Prism plays. <laughs> um, but Vestige of Soul is one of the equipment engines that allows for this Awakener. I've been calling it an OTK deck because it basically is. But like you can get an overpowered like turbo turn of like multiple Tome of Divinities if you just turn on the Vestige and have the right cards. There's so many options of card drawing right now that Prism uh, is capable of these just massive, massive turns where. They go from no board state to just everything. In one instance, they get the lockdown combo. Um, you know, they get everything. But you're talking like Angel of Erudition draws two cards, has go again. Herald of Erudition has dominate. Usually they're running Goliath Gauntlet on top of that. Right? Um, you know, so you're usually coming in for seven plus dominate on there. They're like, no one's coming in for five dominate on a Herald anymore. They either have the gauntlet or angelic wrath backup. Like no one just comes in for five unless they're desperate. So like, it's almost completely unblockable at this point. Like they will draw cards. And then if something goes into soul like that, the Tome of divinities are drawing three cards a pop and they're just, I don't know why every prism player seems to find two or more in a single turn every time, but <laughs> it seems to be the way they do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, they, so we're talking in that instance, like, you know, a bit of a high roll, but you know, you're drawing 13 ish cards in a turn. Um, you're pitching another, you know, six to 10 cards. You're spending a massive amount of resources. You're attacking for three or four times uh, within that turn. You're playing an aura or two. Uh, you know, you're bringing a figment out, you're flipping, you're doing all these things. You've just, the world is your oyster uh, and they can just end the game basically like right there, regardless of what the life total is. You still play it out, but like, you know, if it's, once it's done, it's done. <laughs> um, but so like, this is just soul is the engine that really makes that thing go with the extra pitch uh, when, uh, when you, when you meet the conditions there. So if Prism Awakener soul is to break out, and have uh and i believe it would be through the vestige fuel deck rob catton ran the the battle hard winning uh one in it with kind of the shell that i'm thinking of here um so uh i will go with vestige of soul for all those words that i just said i mean i've seen it happen and i don't like it and i think you're still correct there um my pick though so this is going to be a real left field pick so I'm thinking that this might be the the most across the board uh, dangerous warriors have been going into a, a, an event like the Pro Tour, right? Mm-hmm. In a, in, mm-hmm. in maybe ever. And that means we have the best eyes in the game on Warrior. And when I think of that, I feel like they have to check everything. And, and sometimes you can find something. And what I want people to find is helm of the sharp eye in a deck Ooh, i mean the the potential yeah. of that card is pretty high the the ceiling uh-huh. side the floor is extremely low <laughs> but if if something's going on with this meta where warriors could probably somehow hedge against yeah. like you know like the uh-huh. the kind of like unnatural kind of uh the attack reaction esque nature of that game yeah i think that helm of the sharp eye could be a really cool pick but i i mean i, I am hey i, I like that pick point zero one percent chance it shows up at all <laughs> i'll tell you what if a uh if a certain uh fluky box uh 
player shows up with Dory, uh, he's been known to run Helm of the Sharp Eye. Um, for, for a while there, my Dory build was uh, inspired by his and ran uh, six uh, Stroke of Foresights, oh, red man. and blue, with Eye of Aphidia, and we ran Helm of the Sharp Eye as our main main piece. So you kind of you opted, you stacked, you stroked, uh, and you set it up, and you go big on there. I'll tell you what, there is no there is no better feeling than going blind on off of Sharp Eye hitting and uh, winning a game because of it. Oh, so yeah. I've done it once. Uh, you know, it, that, that's my four touchdowns in a single game. I, I swear <laughs> to God, uh, I've peaked doing that one, one off a of blind, uh, sharp eye, uh, pull. Yeah. I mean, it, it's awesome. I want to see it now. Other cards in your deck, you know, you're, you're everything you're putting in your deck. Is there a card that's going to be a, a breakout that like people had been looking at? perhaps never really got there, but we start to see it on stream. People are like, Oh wait, actually this card's really good. Why are we not playing more of this? I think people want it to be that standing order, but I don't think it's, I, I like, I don't think it's it. Right. I don't think it's there. Um, I'm going to go, I've been super high on tenacity since it came out and I don't think it's in enough decks. I think people kind of pigeonhole it into like a, like a five Katsu, uh, you know, just kind of aggro thing where they can link it out, and they can, and it's a great fit, right? I feel like they should be running at least one of them. Um, but you know, uh, I, you know, it has room in warriors. Like if mm-hmm. even like Kasai's, like if you're running your hit and runs and your second weapon go again, if you kind of telegraph your hits, uh, you know, and kind of let them block two, three cards, uh, there and still end with a tenacity on, on the third chain link after they've blocked five, like they're still eating 10 damage at the end of your turn there. Um, but it's, uh, I, it's a very underutilized. I think it has a home in Bolton, uh, for a lot of the same reasons. Mm-hmm. Like you can threaten a lot with the, uh, um, with the card draw one. I can't uh, think of the name at the moment there, but uh, you know, Bolton does have some on hits, uh, going on there. Uh, the uh oh man i'm drawing a blank on all bolt, the bolton cards bolt right courage, now yeah um, Cur- bolt of courage and uh bolt uh something of enlightenment um uh, i think it just might be enlightenment maybe it's enlightenment yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's one more there's there's one more that charges and goes into soul if it was hit mm-hmm. that's what i'm thinking of but um there so uh, like yellow matters bolton cares about all that stuff so uh i think it fits fits pretty well there um I would like to see, like in a perfect world, uh, some warriors are going to show up with some like kooky attacks, right? attack actions, and I think tenacity kind of fits that bill. Uh, and it'd be nice to see, like a just a big tenacity. It would be a good one. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you on tenacity. I love it in Bolton. Uh, you know, obviously has its place in Ninja. It probably could find some other spots somewhere. But I, I am picking standing order. I think that card is 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 better than people give it credit for i i think you know i i'll talk I disagree about- sir <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, well i mean i also played in riptide where it feels like it's just made for that deck but yes um, yeah, i'll give you that yeah in the right deck it's great i think that there are a, a lot of a lot of other decks can really use it i don't want to say because i've seen some lists that people are bringing that are running that and it, it seems like it's going to be a real all-star uh, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but you'll see this weekend maybe. But it is, uh, I think it's a badass card. I love that card so much. But Tommy, Tommy, I was thinking of Engulfing Light. Oh, Engulfing Light. Oh. Bolt of Courage, Engulfing Light. Like the two, only maybe the only two like block must block cards. <laughs> well, and, and the Lumina turn is a must block. So you know, or not yeah, must block, yeah, but yeah. it is one of the uh, yeah better times to play the tenacity at the end, especially on Raiden Bolton, but. Let's talk about some teams, and we're not going to go super in depth here. We're not going to talk about every team member. I want to talk about name the team, kind of the outside perception that we have of them, like briefly, and then we'll we'll talk about. We kind of we went through this before we started recording, and we we picked our uh, player from the team that has the best odds for this weekend. I think we mm-hmm. think, and then perhaps the dark horse from that team. You know, th- we're not discounting anybody else on the team. I think any of these people, 
you know, playing, have a good shot. But we we got to pick, and we want to be controversial, folks. And you can clip this, you know, or something mm-hmm. like that, and post it on Twitter. And in the in the new version of Fresh and Buds that incorporates a lot of off the rails TCG <laughs> on there, we're all about the hot takes. So teams, Pat. We, teams, we teams, say teams nothing. so much. Gosh, <laughs> what's the teams counter up to? Who knows? But the first one I want to talk about uh, for this weekend is the Fabled Runaways. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're mm-hmm. talk of the town. They're, they, you know, they got some great members there. Cody Williams, Daniel Rakowski, Craig Kremples. I mean, the list goes on and on and on uh, with the Fabled Runaways. Now, mm-hmm. who... Or what do you, what do you, what's, first of all, what's your take on the Fable Runaways and what's, who do you, who do we think is, uh, the, the best odds to, to make a real run at LA? Really? The Fable Runaways is like an ever growing team. I feel like their roster is like 40, 50 deep at this point. There's like Fable Runaways, like West Coast. There's Fable Runaways, like south there's fable runaways new japan there's fable runaways wcw you know there's fable there's actually fable runaways wolf pack which is a really inconvenient uh <laughs> title happening there but there's there there are a lot of very good players um we we have a couple uh runaways that are local to us and and james silver and fino black and um obviously those guys who are are, are top level uh flesh and blood players there and it seems like everybody is there when you consider about you know who some of the best players are in the game like all of them come up um and uh especially uh someone like uh like dan rakowski you know which Mm -hmm. i think we were saying is our our uh you know the best odds of performing well at ptla he's got a history of performing well right he's uh, placed very high in, uh, at nationals uh, not too long ago. Uh, a very consistent competitor, and uh, you know usually brings you know brings that top level game that uh, you know the Runaways are known for uh, there. And you know talking about backing, you know you have the Wanji Lees and the Finos and the Silvers and the uh, Colognes and such. Uh, you know behind behind that group, and they're very capable of you know. Of of putting those right, putting that putting all that that power to work uh, towards that towards that common goal of uh, of winning. And if they have if they have like the team deck, you know, he's he, Dan's a great pilot. Absolutely, and and I, I I'm you know we agreed on Daniel here. You know, there, there's a lot of great picks here. I mean, hell, I mean Eshke could really make a run. This could be a good, great meta for yeah, for, for right? Big Pat out there. Um, now I, the reason I picked Daniel is well. You know, it's been it's been a minute since his his hot runs at, at Nats and 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 um, you know even he had a great run at Worlds that year and I think he's mm-hmm. hungry I think he's hungry he's ready you know um, he's been testing out a lot of different things I've I've passed two times I've played him I beat him just putting it out there but he was on two different things and he's tr- trying out things he's having fun it's, so it's on Jim Dan you on heard it it's, only it's, one it's, of them was rated though the other one wasn't rated so you know <laughs> the the elo uh wasn't uh, i didn't tank too much elo for him but you know he's a great competitor and i think he's i think he's hungry and and that's that's my mm-hmm. pick for for the best odds from the failed runaways but in terms of a dark horse i got to go with my buddy Craig Kremples you know coming mm-hmm. off of a top 8 nationals run uh this past year you know this is this is a guy who is just an a uh, an amazing pilot, right? Like you can give Craig, I think, any deck, and he's gonna figure it out. And he's gonna pilot it probably the best he can outside of a specialist, right? With with that uh-huh. specific deck. So I would look at Craig. You know, I don't know what he's on, but it's gonna be interesting to see how he pilots whatever he is on uh, when it gets to that point. So Craig's my pick. Um as well and you know obviously great card player forever but next is the sunflower samurais who has a pro tour winner on their team in Mm -hmm. the form Mm -hmm. of pablo pintor sunflower samurais you know they are a spain based i think mostly spain uh based team where you know you have players like pablo 
Daniel Correas, there are so many, you know, they're, they're a tight knit group of friends. And this is like kind of a mm-hmm. little bit different, not to say that the runaways aren't friends or anything like that, but this is a different vibe of a team, right? It's just, it's just friends. All really, There's so many of them over there. The runaways, they're more like acquaintances, right? You got a big <laughs> office. You can't be friends with everybody. Yeah. Sunflower families is a small family business. Everybody loves each other there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, I think that that that's that's the kind of vibe that I enjoy. And, you know, when I had Pablo You're on gonna the show, find me. I'm gonna, there's like a runaway like behind me. Just, know, right? <laughs> oh my god, it's Cody Williams now. Uh, <laughs> um, and you know, I think Pat, you know, we got to agree, Pablo's a, a, a real front runner here. I think so. His scarf game is obviously world class. Uh, his his denim game is world championship level as well. Uh, but like he's also, you know, we're I think we're gonna start seeing kind of a common thread here, where like he's a great pilot. Like he 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 brought Bravo all the way to uh, calling finals not too long ago, lost to an Icelander. He's won a Pro Tour on a Rune Blade. Uh, he really liked that. He's been known to play. Uh, he won a he won a calling on Oldham. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's always, uh, he's one of those players that if you know, he's there, he's automatically one of the favorites to win that given event. And he's going to be in pro tour LA and he's one of the favorites to win the event. First time, two time pro tour winner would be mm-hmm. pretty cool. Pretty cool. Now the yeah. dark horse has to be Daniel Correa's. Uh, I've already seen on Twitter. Daniel's like hanging out with some, some runaways and, and you know, kind of yeah, getting some, the feel some cross pollination. Yeah, well, you know, maybe maybe a little like agent, double agent kind of thing. I don't know. That may, maybe not. You know, really getting too much insider info. But Daniel, you know, pops up here and there. Great pilot as well. You know, one of those guys. I think has had some great runs with with uh, Brute in the past, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is a the closest we've seen to a, a brute meta in a very, very long time. So um, I think Pablo does, I believe credit him as being kind of the brains behind a lot of the samurai team decks as well. So, yeah, and that's, and that's like something interesting to talk about as well. in teams, like sometimes you just got to have like really good roles. You got your pilots, you got your Pablos, your mm-hmm. Kremples, and then you got your, your deck builders, you know, your, your mad scientists like Daniel or, 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 you know, arguably what Ethan does for, you know, a lot of the Levias stuff on the runaways, etc. Mm-hmm. So uh, pretty interesting. All eyes are always on Pablo. He's, he's the first pro tour winter or winner, not winter uh, winter's whale. He won with maybe, I don't know if it was banned yet. Uh, no, it was, it was already banned. He did not win with winter's whale. He ended up sending Oldham to living legend. Greatest um, comeback game of all time. Yeah. Pablo Pintor yeah, against Lexi. Oh yeah, this. well, and he started O two at Pro Tour New Jersey. New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, Look, he's done it. He's done the things. He's done all the things. He plays from behind very well. You know, he's he's a he's a force to be reckoned with. Now, blue pitch. Oh, we love some team blue pitch here. Yeah, in, in this house. Oh man, let's. I'll just let's get on this ride with me here. Yeah, all put right, on the team, blue team pitch hat right now. <laughs> See, I want. I want the jersey. I want the hat. Uh, team Blue Pitch coming out of Hong Kong, uh, the sister team, if you will, to the card guys. Um, they have been uh, a presence in uh, like on, like on the online armory scene, like very early on. Like Hong Kong is notorious for having these elite like grinders that that come about. We saw the Kelvin Law in the Celebrational, uh, right? Is one of the top Hong Kong players, thus putting him in the top of like the world in terms of players. And you see him compete with Brody Spurlock, who's often considered, you know, in that, in that, uh, uh, that same role there. Uh, but the, the team at blue pitch have uh, been just absolute killers for so long. And they have just not had the exposure uh, that they needed. And they kind of had like a coming out party here at worlds this past uh this past year here and both uh putting tang and uh i'm sorry putting tam and uh uh sing Xing sang uh who made the finals against um was a finalist at worlds uh both you know both both from the same team top eight had to actually face each other in the quarterfinals 
uh, of that game. But I believe two more blue pitch players were in like the top 16 of that. It was a really successful tournament for them. Uh, but it, you would often see them, it, if you go back to some of the card guy stream, they've done some showcase matches, five on fives. Um, and uh, they just had one for heavy hitters, but they had one before that, like not too long ago, where uh, I believe they 5 0 to the card guys um, in that in that showcase match. And that's saying something, yeah. right? Like card guys, we love the card guys, all right? The pretty legit, uh, pretty legit team. Uh, and I imagine, I think we'll be talking about them shortly here, but to blank them like that, like you really get a, you really got to have some firepower there. Um, but uh, the, I think the best odds of uh, someone winning, you know, having a, a great uh, showing here at Pro Tour, at least going to be Alan Lau, uh, one of the marquee members of the team uh, there has a has a uh, has a good history with them. Is that they haven't had a lot of exposure uh, in, internationally, but uh, like I said, they it, it their time is now. All right, and uh, I think <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Alan Alan Lau uh, kind of leads that charge here. Well, yeah, definitely, and, and certainly in the LSS roundtable, and you know, to like kind of throw like a Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. reference here. It seems like LSS has their eye fixed on blue pitch and they mm -hmm. seem to be for really good really, reason. Yeah. For good reason. Yep. And, and Alan Lau is certainly a great player here and, and certainly our pick for the, the best, but our dark horse is going to be putting Tam though. Mm -hmm. I think you could probably interchange a lot of these players here, you know, absolutely. And, but we're, we're just going to take putting because, you know, why not? We, we, because you know, you know why we're picking Putin because we talked about Katsu as possibly a dark mm -hmm. horse, all right? And there might not be a better uh, Katsu pilot in the world uh, than a Pudding Tam. He's he uh, he he was the one that made Katsu uh, a top eight worlds deck. Uh, he's he's kind of put his footprint down on there. Um, it's coming in this spring. He's they they started having more of a social media presence lately, and Pudding has put a lot of uh, like Katsu you know, cards out there, uh, psyop or not, you know, he's kind of, he's maintained the, the popularity uh, of that and kind of pioneering, uh, what Katsu can be at a highly competitive level there. He has said, he said he's tested some other decks, so, you know, it might not be a shoe in there, but, um, yeah, there are like, there, there are like five or six members of that team and any single one of them I think has both, you know, the, a, a good odds of performing well, as well as, uh, you know, uh, could be considered a dark horse for coming up and uh, being an up and comer in the in the international pro scene here. So, just team blue pitch all the way. Shirts, jerseys, hats. Like they got the uh, uh, even LSS has got the oh my god LSS has the blue pitch sign <laughs> on there. Everyone's like part in this fail. It's not. It's the team. It's team blue pitch. It, I mean, it is going to be. Uh, I mean. I almost a disappointment if they don't make a deep run <laughs> at this point. Like it's really, it's like, it's all being built up. Yeah. Yeah. Is, <laughs> is it part of the flesh and blood script is the real question. But um, now I, the next team I it's, this is, this is a personal one for me because it's my team, the conspiracy, uh, you know, a Jersey based team out of the Guild Raven games, you know, you're going to hear a lot more from us. This is going to be the coming out party for the conspiracy. Now I just wanted to talk right. about, we had four players uh, playing in the pro tour. Uh, we have Justin Rowland. We got David Lee, uh, who had a, the, a great deep run at the Calling Hartford, and uh, John or Chen Yun Liu, and then uh, uh, Dung Lee, who goes by Young. And oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. all great all right. players. Oh yeah, we got we got some heavy hitters here. You know, the the, the we you know we're trying to stake our name, but I gotta say our best odds, you know, to to like have a deep run here is got to be David Lee. Right, David is is a insanely great pilot, and it's someone that you know you, you just look and he's just somehow in the zone, but like will be in the zone and then turn to you and say something and like you know you know bust your chops a little bit, which is you know why I, I enjoy David Lee. I, I, this is a this is a fun thing. I like fun, and the dark horse has to be Justin Rowland because. You know, Justin Rowland, who, who's a bud, who's been hanging in the Buds Discord for a long time, is is a player that 
when he gets in the zone, he is dangerous and can be one of the better pilots. And, you know, I think uh, for the both of them, I think the drafts are going to have to go their way, right? You know, but I, I really like the deck that we're on. And, you know, uh, I'm excited to see uh, some some stuff happen this weekend. But I just need to, you know, throw it out there. You know, we, we, we're, we're, we're coming to get you, the conspiracy. <laughs> conspiracy <laughs> they're out to get you yeah uh next team is pcg pass though this is a this is a certainly maybe the most star-studded team uh out there you know you got your your hayden dales your brendan patrick's your tark patels your matt rogers your nick butchers what do you have on this team pat what's what's your read on them the uh, team PCG pass is a, a slight amalgamation of a lot of different types of uh, teams that have been, uh, you know, worn different jerseys, the same kind of group uh, for for a long time. And there's a bit of a, a, a joining of forces with the Arsenal pass crew um, and what was, you know, I, I believe their team Dragon Shield at one time, uh, but they've always kind of gone together. This is like, you know, if you if you were putting a super group together. Right for like a you know the super group rock and roll band this is like Velvet Revolver is that a super group I'm gonna go with that uh, Audio Slave something like that this is kind of you know I guess Fab's version of that and there's a lot of good players you know, a lot of people in the goat conversation with like Matt Rogers um, but uh, I think in terms of like you know the person who's who I think especially right now is producing at the highest level I think it's Nick Butcher I think he's he's showing up at uh like he he won his nationals um uh he has shown up on uh on the the biggest stage and has 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 done very very well uh a lot recently and uh he's been making a point to especially on the APAC regions uh like callings uh he's made it a point to show up there and I believe he just won a calling um down so. there uh so you know he's i think he's kind of on the rise i think he's a name that's been discussed a lot and you might get kind of o- overlooked with uh someone like a Tark or a matt rogers but i think definitely nick butcher uh is primed for uh a top eight spot here at pro tour la no absolutely and and this is a name that we've been hearing over and over again for a long time and and it's really a matter of the international stage. Does does Nick Butcher get to that point? And uh, we think that you know he really has. Um, he could be primed to be doing that this weekend. Now, in terms of a dark horse, I got to give it to Hayden Dale, uh, only because he's, smash, <laughs> smash, he's just so gosh dang <laughs> handsome. God, uh, I can't stop it. But honestly, I mean, I don't know what Hayden Dale's playing, but gosh, I hope it's Reinar <laughs> because I mean, mm-hmm. just. Just poetry, folks. Uh, that would be incredible. I mean, we know that Hayden Dale can uh, play well. We've seen him perform excellent mm-hmm. at these high-level tournaments. I think uh, even what was it World San Jose? I mean, that that was where uh, you know he had some uh, heartbreak against Reinar, for, if I remember yep. correctly. Yep, that's uh, right. Yep. But this would be a good time to revisit. California and you know rewrite history with some Reinar Hayden if if you're listening and we hope that you are because I think that would be a lot of fun and a really good watch yeah and I think that's another one of those teams that um you know there's so like Tark Patel is not someone to slouch on right like he can easily be be you know one of our our odds on favorites as well as considered a dark horse because you know he hasn't necessarily won something lately he's still got he's still got a multinational title picture like behind him but um you know he's 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 due for uh for one lately as well and matt rogers is just uh show he was at battle harden recently i believe top aided in the battle harden he playing kasai uh, uh which is after my own heart he has he's been playing dash for so long um but yeah that whole whole team even brent patrick might show up on kano here uh, he, he might. It depends on what everyone else is running. Maybe he'll pivot into something. <laughs> Surprise! You know, we'll see. We'll see how see how it goes there. Uh, but yeah, PCG Pass is is uh, you know, they're 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 I guess like not the highest profile, but also kind of like those the players. I think the highest ceiling of team is probably 
this, these guys right here. The name recognition alone is is yeah yeah is uh, something that you can't really scoff at. Now the next team is the card guys. We already mentioned them, and you know as long as they don't play against Team <laughs> Blue Pitch, uh, yeah. they should be fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, yeah. a lot of great players on, on on the card guys. You know, some have been on this show, and most recently is my pick to to make the furthest run is Nathan Crawford. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think we both agree that our reasons are for Nathan Crawford is like, well, he's, he's kind of been on the cusp. He's, he's yeah. talked about it publicly. Mm-hmm. We talked about it on the, on the podcast and he's hungry. And I think that can be just enough sometimes. And he's certainly yeah. a great pilot. He, you know, puts a lot of his time and effort and what he's thinking about into this game. And I'd be really excited to see Nathan Crawford, uh, you know, make a deep run, but what's your take on the card guys? Yeah, we love the card guys. Uh, you know, Nathan and Josh. I've also I've had on the show. Like they're great to talk to. Um, I've I've talked to uh, Kyle. They're the manager uh, a bit as well. And uh, I just casted a game with uh, Will Bradshaw, um, where I actually <laughs> I was basically like murder him, murder <laughs> Will. Uh, but uh, I, we do love those guys. They're very good. You know, they're they're good for the community. They're mm. they're their community outreach is is very good but you know nathan is has been uh he you know his his recently brought up that he's basically he's bubbled out right at the top eight uh, a lot of events and you know uh the consensus really is like right these big tournaments are you're kind of meant to lose here right if if you're performing consistently over over time, there's so much variance that takes place that kind of outside of your control here. And it, he keeps consistently showing up there. It's just a matter of right those things going right for him that time, and he's and he's there, right? And he's in it, and he's he's done this thing. And you know, law of averages says you know it's it's got to come up. But you know, this is a uh, we talk about this wide open meta that's. Uh, right for a warrior to really come in and 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 dominate here and who better to represent that uh that new representation here um but josh lau the the, you know the warrior guy um (laughs) you know he and he uh you know known for dory and i think dory is in a really good place right now but he's been uh he's been playing a lot of olympia which surprised some people and um uh, recently winning in, winning in RTN, uh, but Josh has been streaming and playing with Olympia for quite a quite a bit the last six weeks or so, uh, going into uh, coming into Pro Tour here, and um, you know it, it, whether he's on uh, Kasai or Bolton, you know obviously he's a great Bolton player as well, and Bolton is another right we. we there's so it's so wide open bolton's well positioned as a warrior and hits like a truck and you know this is a great time to play switch bolton or you know you can play just raid and bolton and and have some success uh here but um you know whoever josh picks uh I, you know he's he's likely the best person on that hero regardless uh and you know he he hasn't had a, a lot of top finishes lately and he's he's one that's definitely due to mm. to get in uh you know in the top 16 top eight here yeah absolutely and you know that's he's the perfect pick for a dark horse here because if it if it really does line up right where this is the warrior meta josh could really do it and and we'd love to see it you know you know you see mm-hmm. it literally gives like state of the union addresses on on warriors so like you know it's just like yeah you know. yeah and <laughs> and you know people listen yeah like and for good that's, he's an authority of it and we have this last team here. It's Team Ascent. You know, they have some great players here. Uh, some just mm-hmm. more more buddies, uh, you know, than anything. You know, you got a, a lot of, like, your Easton Douglases, you know, you Dagan mm-hmm. Whites, mm-hmm. Mo Bogsley, Mark Johnson, as he's been called before. You know, there is a lot coming out of that team that has had some success in the past. And, you know, they – are are always there you know they always have somebody in the running and i gotta say maybe this is recency bias but last week i had Dagan way up back on the show and you know talking to Dagan during the podcast and after um there is a level of confidence but there's also a little level of hunger as well you know like we're talking with nathan and, and some of these other guys that 
you know, Dagan, Dagan wants to not just do well day one. <laughs> he wants to do well day two as well. So, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and I think that, you know, he is being challenged this meta by it being so open and, you know, like how can he actually find his place here? And I think he's actually really challenging himself with deck building, which is awesome. I'm really excited to see the spice that he brings. Uh, big fan of Dagan White this upcoming weekend. Yeah, uh, Team Ascent is, I think, low-key uh, growing into one of the uh, the higher-tier teams uh, in competitive Flesh and Blood. Uh, like, uh, names that we, had, we haven't even talked about. Rhea Adams and Levi Roush are yeah. both Team Ascent players, right? Like, it's so hard to pick, you know... You know, just just one or two uh, great players because there's so many uh, going on there. But you know, we talk about um, how uh, recently Kano has really kind of emerged as uh, going from a niche, uh, you know, hero into something that very possibly may be a mainstream selection here. This might be a favorite, uh, you know, hero uh, to choose here at Pro Tour. You know, if if People still haven't packed their AB4 and 18, you know, damage prevention effects. You know, Kano's got got a shot here. And, uh, you know, a, a Levia enthusiast, but also kind of OG Kano pilot in Mark Mo Bugsley uh, Johnson, uh, you know, I think is a great dark horse pick here. I believe he's going to be on Kano coming into Pro Tour. I think he did a lot of good work and I believe won an RTN with uh levia um or top top forward he did very well with levia recently um but with the kind of the kano discourse being what it was uh he did uh recently i believe revert back to kano uh, and has been piling that recently so uh, you know uh mark on on kano with his lightning queen uh crocs flashing all over the place i think is a great uh, dark horse pick from team ascent Absolutely. And then, you know, of course we could make that pick and then he makes a, uh, a midnight switch back to Levia. But either picks I think are actually quite fine into this meta. So, uh, Mo, you know, I, yeah, I hate Levi to inflate your more. ego any more than it needs to be, but we, we had to we had to do it to you. Uh, you're the best. Uh, those are all the teams. Or is are we forgetting one, Pat? Is there is there one? Is there one that we might Oh, be have no fear, Roger Bodie. We have to bring up the Wolfpack. <laughs> <laughs> the Wolfpack is a well, a big team, certainly. They're um, big. You know, when 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 I had Michael Fang on a couple weeks ago, you know, he he referred to it as as people that just general genuinely enjoy being around each other. Maybe a little bit mm-hmm. more of that sunflower samurai feel, but on a larger scale. Uh, you know, but you have a lot of big names here. And what's your take on the Wolfpack? Uh, Wolfpack gaming, gaining a lot of uh, recognition for Zach Bunn kind of bringing it all together and then bringing on Michael Hamilton, obviously having a world championship to their name, uh, you know, gave them some some street cred right off the bat. Um, Zach's brother, Tim, has been involved for a very long time, and they have been a very tight-knit, happy group, uh, and they keep growing uh, and adding great players. Most recently, uh, you know, we talked about Michael Fang um, uh, coming in, a defending Pro Tour champions, and then you got a World Tour, you got a World Champ, you got a Pro Tour Champ, and, uh, and you have a Pro Tour finalist that recently joined on as well in Mara Ferris. Uh, who is our, our dark horse pick here from the wolf pack, right? Empress, uh, the Empress of Volcor herself, Dromai, pilot Dromai is, is in a great spot right now. And who better uh, to, to push her, uh, you know, back into a finals of a pro tour than Mara herself. Mara is one of those uh, exceptions to the rule. What I was talking about earlier on, um, you know, she, for a very long time, was, uh, trained uh and practiced uh essentially solo like she did she she did some work you know outside to get to you know do do the things that she needed to do but um she is a spreadsheet nut and was doing all the analysis one had to do in order to really right Im- improve those numbers and you know she she developed that dromai list and and attacked the meta basically on her own and 
uh, you know, was recruited to, and she she has been she has rejected offers from other teams. Uh, but when the Wolfpack came out uh, to to ask her to join, she she finally coalesced and, and joined a, a competitive team in the Wolfpack. Like because it checks all the all the right boxes, you know, for a lot of people. They're they're tight knit, they're happy, they're enthusiastic, and and they 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 take the game seriously, but not you know not too seriously. And uh, and they back that up with wins. Like the team is stacked. It's a stacked team. There's so many, so many good players on there. It is uh, pretty impressive that team, and you know, Mar being the dark horse here, and I think Fang being our our, our pick to to go the distance, right? You mm-hmm. know, another Pro Tour winner. It's hard hard not to. I mean, obviously Michael Hamilton could be slotted right into that slot, but you know, I think it's just only fitting to have. Uh, Fang and Mara's names next to each other on this uh, these show notes mm-hmm. that I have, and and you know, our, it would be awesome to see a, a rematch in the time in, in, in yeah, for sure. You know, some place obviously they don't want that as a team, but I think if right, it's right. towards the end of the tournament in like a top eight situation, uh, you know, both two members of your team are in the top eight. That's pretty awesome. So that's the teams. Mm-hmm. We said teams a lot today, Pat. A lot of teams, a lot of teams. I will say just just one one thing just to add on there is that if there if there was a pro tour or a high level event where I think LSS and you know the the community as a whole should start caring about uh, start caring about um, the players outside of the top eight. I think this is the one where they should really put some emphasis on the top sixteen, top thirty two, the players and deck choices because. There's going to be there. We just talked about a litany of of teams here, and we're going to be spending a lot of the weekend talking about who's on right, who from what team is is at the top tables going from day one into into day two, and and you know we're it's fun, right? It's a it's a it's a it's a fun time, and they're going to be uh you know there's going to be conversations about who's you know whose team is winning the weekend here and uh we're we're going to need to know more than the top 8 i think to really kind of grasp success here for from the group and you know uh we don't often get a lot of uh outside of the top 8 coverage and you know deck lists and name recognition from there but i think now's the time this this is the weekend to really you know, don't don't leave it to a, a screenshot of a piece of paper stuck on the wall yeah. right at the end of Swiss. Give us give us you know give us the names here on uh, on the main site. Absolutely, and and I mean, hey, we you know we we named a lot of people, but we specifically called out sixteen people here, right today, and mm-hmm. to to perhaps see this amazing top sixteen. Wow, we really yeah, we just picked out the, yeah right we to to the T. That's our bracket. This is, this is the prediction. This is our prediction. Yep. <laughs> Flesh and blood, March Madness. Now, Pat, uh, we're not going to get to any listener questions, well, because uh, I I had the two unfortunate yeah, technical I, difficulties I, with two other <laughs> guests that were supposed to come on, and I thought about I, asking you the questions anyway, but you don't know a whole lot about Brazil. I can't imagine. I know, I know. <laughs> and, um, you know, I always wanted to go there, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I don't know if um, you could really uh, answer for D- Dylan over at TCG Talk. We will get Leo and from Luminaris and Dylan from TCG Talk on the show again. I'm going to save those listener questions uh, for when they come back. But thank you, Pat, for being my pinch hitter yet again. Coming in literally almost, I texted you maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half before I was supposed yeah. to record with. Uh, I was just chilling. Yeah, I was ready, you were, ready to go. Yeah, and you yep. were you were a champ as always. Uh, Thank you very much. Please plug everything. Sure. Uh, I am Patrick Shaw. You can find me in Off the Rails TCG. Uh, that is the name of my YouTube channel where I host the Action Point podcast. We just released uh, our first episode of 2024. Where we're getting back on the saddle here, but uh, check that out. We had Howling or Scott Howling Minds, uh, Shamir Sami. Uh, Roger Bodie and Oscar Gomez on, and we had a great discussion. Uh, we talked all things. We talked Kano. We talked Prism. Uh, we talked heavy heavy hitters, lore, or the lack thereof. But it was a really fun conversation uh, with those four uh, gentlemen. So you know, check it out. That's the latest episode. Find me on social media as well uh, at Off the Rails TCG. My personal is at Pat Smash Good. Uh, we have a Discord. Uh, you know, join join the fun. 
uh, I'm saying I've been telling people that uh, you're basically when you join the Discord at Off the Rails TCG, you essentially become like my producer because you <laughs> you have a lot of say of what happens into the show. So yeah. join in there and tell me what to do, and uh, you know I I will do it. Uh, so that's that's where you can find me. Please check out all of that, and I'm hoping to get back on the action points soon, Pat. That'd be a lot of fun. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, you can continue to find me on Twitter at Fresh Buds Pod. Check out the YouTube. Give us a little like, comment, subscribe. The Buds Discord is an awesome place to hang out. It's where you can submit listener questions uh, that I can save for a later date for when, <laughs> whenever you know I actually talk to the people. But the archive, <laughs> the idea, yeah, throw them to the archive, and uh, please check out my indie game podcast I do with my cousin Maddie uh, called uh, Fresh Juice. We will be at PAX East this weekend. Uh, one of the reasons I'm not going to LA, uh, we'll be, you know, talking to indie devs and stuff like that. If you want to uh, say hi, if you're at PAX East, please reach out on the discord or anything like that. And, you know, are you doing it like for the pot, are you recording like interviews? Yeah, we're going to record are you, some stuff are you for man TikTok. on the street type yeah. stuff. Oh, oh, street, like almost it. like the letterbox stuff, you know, like what's your four favorite games or something like that. You know, it'd be kind of fun. Um, That's so really shoving it in their faces. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it should be fun. And finally food. I mean, I, you know, this is, you, you're, you're going to have to come up with some, crazier and crazier stuff oh man uh food what can i what can i do to scare you uh did i did i tell you about no really all right let's so <laughs> this isn't a weed podcast but uh uh one of my favorite dishes of all time um was uh <laughs> this uh i made a homemade uh <laughs> i wanted cookies and cream ice cream um and uh like under under the influence of perhaps some some you know enlightening uh, substances here, sure. but uh, a regular bowls wouldn't cut it. So I got some cookie dough and I made like a cookie dough volcano and I cooked that cooked that up. And we're talking just like the whole the whole thing of cookie dough, like not just not just a little bit, but we made a cookie dough bowl. And we put uh, we put a bunch of ice cream in there. Like I'm like a five scooper kind of guy, and so we were we were doing stuff with the uh, with the Oreo uh, Oreo cookies themselves. Uh, so uh, my job was to you know twist and then scrape the cream off. So I took a I had a whole like sleeve of Oreos uh, and just stacked up the whole. The whole thing there, and you might be asking yourself, "Did he?" Yes, I did. I ate, I ate the whole, the whole thing. Had the ice cream in the giant tub, uh, tub there, and I think I've mentioned the, uh, the shell stuff oh, as yeah. well on there before, um, and some melted peanut butter. But that was, uh, it was a lot. It was a lot. It was really good. Regretted it in the morning, but uh, it's just the cookie bowl volcano is what we're. What we're focusing on here. Well, uh, go do that. Do that. Have some ice cream. Get a whole thing of cookie dough. Make it into a bowl. Cook it. Put some ice cream in it. Folks, have yourself a good time, folks. You can do that. Uh, we Man. don't have we, we don't have the Surgeon's General warning on the podcast, but there probably would be for that. It's a it's a it sounds amazing, and well, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> I mean, if yeah. if it wasn't so late. And I knew I like I knew I didn't have a five hour car ride tomorrow. Maybe I would do that tonight, but tomorrow I'll be having Colony Grill Pizza in in Connecticut. Good stuff. If anybody ooh, ever stops ooh, by, right. but yeah. um, thank you all. We don't have time for Charmer, of course. Why would we, folks? Ever screw you, Charmer? What team are you on, <laughs> dude? No, uh, uh, but uh, stay fresh and enjoy the Pro Tour. <laughs> <laughs>